topic today is how to convince a socialist Bill Evers. I read that outside. And, uh, <laughs> and we're lucky that that's not the topic, because I'm sure if I were a socialist, it, I'd be tough to convince. But anyway, <laughs> we have to look at this, it seems to me, in a common sense way, and that is to consider it's just like the problem a socialist would face in trying to convince a thoughtful, knowledgeable libertarian. It's useful to have facts about existing socialist societies, but if you think in your own life, a lot of people have pulled a fact or two on you and expected you to roll over in your political views, and you didn't. And really, if somebody were trying to convince a libertarian to change his or her political views, the way to do it would be to go after the core values, the core notions, the core concepts that a libertarian holds, namely ones about property and about liberty. Well, similarly, in going about convincing a socialist, it's very valuable to have facts. It's very valuable to know about existing socialist societies, existing socialist movements, even ancient socialistic societies, such as maybe the, the Peruvian uh, Empire of the Incas or something like that, if you consider that socialistic, which I do. Um, but I think it's most important to go after the core concepts that uh, motivate socialists, that give them the, the passion and, the, and the, the emotional and intellectual sustenance for their beliefs. So I would say that we have to go after such things as equality, uh, planning, those are core concepts, and, and ancillary to that, I would think, and are how they regard justice and morality and the possibility of civil liberties under socialism. Now, so that's what I'm going to really talk about. Now, it's, it's valuable to, to have facts and to know facts and to know history. It always is. It helps situate you. You know something about the intellectual origins. If you're dealing with a Maoist, it's good to know ironical things about Mao, you know, I don't know, his collaboration with Chiang Kai-shek at various points or his love for the Shah of Iran that upsets a Maoist or with the same with the Trotskyists, you know, Trotsky's involvement in the unprovoked in invasion of Poland in the 1920s or, what, you know, things like this that might set the person on edge. But really we have to go after the concepts. Okay, so I think what we should do and, and even in handling the concepts, facts are important and valuable because if you can then say, not only is your view of inequality wrong and impossible, but by talking about it this way, what socialist movements do is really this, and we can see this in practice in these socialist societies. So facts are valuable, but let's talk about the concepts. Okay. Uh, let me first... Uh, talk about equality a bit here. Uh, is, is, a, is the ideal of equality possible? Now this is very important because really you, you should always tell somebody if they have an ideal, if they have a, 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 an inspiring value that they would like to see enacted, uh, that ought implies can. That is to say that saying that something ought to be the case, a change ought to be enacted, implies that it, it could be done, that it's within the realm of possibility. So if we can say that the notion of equality, of, of a pure equality, is nonsensical, self-contradictory, impossible in human nature, impossible given in the nature of reality, these sorts of things, we can say that it cannot be done, and that then can say something about whether it ought to be done. And most people will understand it when you say something like that, and it will detach them from this belief that they have. Okay, so we know, obviously, that in a purest sense, equality is not possible. As Murray Rothbard points out in Power and Market, which has some powerful anti-egalitarian passages in it, each person cannot be born in the same time and place. Each person cannot be raised under the same conditions. It's just impossible. Even in the most level, the most 
antiseptically imaginable egalitarian society. You could not do that, okay? Similarly, there are aspects of human nature that, that would be commonly accepted, even by somebody that had a lot of profound political differences with you, that you could talk to them about and, and raise serious questions in their own mind, that, that even if you, you didn't seem to be making progress in that argument, would constantly recur to them and in a subsequent conversation, because you don't very often convert somebody in a day. And if you do, they may not stay chained very long. So uh, there's an, a recent book by a, a British political philosopher named John Donne on the politics of socialism, which is kind of a, a disillusioned left liberals look at socialism. And in it he says the, the sort of another formulation of egalitarianism, which is that really each person is entitled to equal respect okay, from everybody else. And this is a way that some socialists will argue about things, because partly because respect is kind of a fuzzy word, and, and our automatic reaction is, yeah, everybody is entitled to equal respect. But that's, not, that's really not true. We couldn't imagine a society in which each person's claims to have their desires taken equally with everybody else. Each person was awarded the, you know, equal patience by all of us for what they, they wanted to talk about, each person's accomplishments. There is not a society imaginable, even given, as Dunn specifically points out, the kinds of depredations on society that a Hitler or a Pol Pot or a Stalin can make, that will still not, in its hearts of hearts, respect a great singer, a great athlete, a, you know, a person that does things beyond ordinary capacity will not award that person a differential kind of respect. So really, inherent in human psychology, just it's not possible to somehow end up with an egalitarian thinking society either. Okay, so we've suggested here that you cannot really have equality. Another thing that I think you have to raise with a person who is a socialist is the role of envy in egalitarianism. And I think that this is, this is a valuable thing because equality strikes people when they're not really reflecting on it a great deal as a very positive thing to try and achieve in a society. And yet envy brings with it different emotional connotations. Now, I, I personally think, and I think if we think about it, envy is a part of human nature that we're realistically never going to be able to do away with, okay? It, it has to do with rivalry and, and different attitudes and so forth. But there are different ways of looking at envy in society. There are ways that uh, elevate envy to a, 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 a kind of a passion that then tr consumes the society, okay? And, and really, socialism, in my view, is trying to do that. It's an immensely envy-conscious, although it doesn't tend to admit this, an envy-conscious, envy-mobilizing uh, movement, okay? And I think if you can draw this to the attention of the person that you're trying to convince, that you're trying to argue with, it will take some of the uh, sense of that person that he or she is on a high ground in arguing for equality away from them. Because it's not somehow as self, uh, you know, it's not as, you, you can't congratulate yourself quite as much in arguing for envy, in my view. <laughs> so. If you're really interested in this, uh, I would recommend a book. I'm not sure how available it is. I, I don't really think it's in print anymore, but if you really search bookstores, you can find it. Old ones, old used bookstores, by Helmut Schuck, S-C-H-O-E-C-K. It's a German political sociologist called Envy. Uh, and, and he has written the definitive work on it. He's kind of a libertarian with conservative uh, tendencies. 
And it's certainly in any university or college library. And it was a Harcourt Brace book. And he talks about this sort of thing. There's also a very interesting uh, sort of science fiction dystopian novel by L.P. Hartley, published in the early 50s at a time of sort of labor austerity in England, called Facial Justice, that gives you a lot of ideas about envy and how to th think about it and talk about it with people. Anyway, so when we talk about equality to a socialist, what can we also tell that socialist is at, is at work in reality in socialist movements in, social, in existing socialist societies? I think we can say that what we're seeing to a large extent is the rhetoric of envy being used as a route to, and a road to power, but as a mechanism, a, a, route, a road to power by a new ruling class. Okay, now that I think puts a realistic coloration on it, and I think if you can get the socialist trying to counter that, say that's not so, uh, I think that you have that person on the defensive, and perhaps through time and conversation, you can bring the person around. Okay, now let's talk about a sort of an adjunct to equality, which is notions about justice and morality. Okay, now this is sort of going back into what libertarians believe, but what a lot of socialists, particularly ones who call themselves democratic socialists, claim to hold high, namely uh, that they believe that socialism will incorporate in it the, the virtues, the gains that have come with capitalistic s civilization while discarding certain uh, outmoded things. Now, I think uh, there are definitely kinds of socialism that are what you might call non-Marxist ethical socialists of some sort. I, there's no special pet name for them, but it's, it's an, a minor thing. Most socialists you're going to meet are deeply influenced by Marx. Okay, They are Marxists of one sort or another. And I think you can honestly tell them, and in a way that hopefully will disturb them unless they are in the most deep sense totalitarians and you will certainly find people you can never convince that's we all know that from our own lives but I think you can prove to them realistically that Marxism rightly understood under, as understood by Marx as understood by Engels as understood by Lenin and Trotsky and all the great classic Marxist thinks, thinkers is a, a, a political view that is devoid of ethics. And it is truly anti-ethical, okay, by nature. It's not just that it doesn't, you know, it's not compatible with Christian morality or Judeo-Christian tradition or libertarian ethics. It is anti-ethics, all ethics, okay? Now this is not just a whim on my part that I have sort of dreamed this up. Marx himself, Engels, all these people say this, okay? And there are good things that have been written explaining this. The, the two best things that I would point to, one is an article by Stephen Lukes, L-U-K-E-S, in Praxis International, which is a socialist publication called Can a Marxist Believe in Human Rights? And the other is an article by uh, Alan Buchanan uh, several years ago in the uh, Journal of Philosophy and Political Affairs, Philosophy and Public Affairs. Uh, also to a lesser extent in uh, Robert C. Tucker's The Marxian Revolutionary Idea, the chapter on distributive justice in that. But let me just read you some of the comments of some of these people and you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay. All right. What is, what is Marx saying? He's saying that morality, like religion, metaphys metaphysics, all the rest of ideology and their corresponding forms of consciousness had no history, no development, but men altering their material production and their material intercourse alter along with these their real existence and their thinking and the products of their thinking. Okay. Have here a little bit of Hegelian Germanic double talk, but what is he saying? He's saying that morality reflects, the history of morality is the history of 
technological development and the property law that relates to technological development, that he believes relates to technological development. It's a completely dependent artificial construction that stems from that, okay? What is Engels saying? He's saying, <clears throat> morality has always been class morality. It has either justified the domination and interests of the ruling class, or ever since the oppressed class became powerful, it has represented the indignation against its domination and the future interests of the oppressed. Okay, there is no intrinsic morality, it's simply a tactical, strategic thing in class struggle. Okay, here's Trotsky. Moral morality, more than any other form of, ide of ideology, has a class character. Okay, here's Lenin. Permissible and obligatory are those and only those means we answer which unite the revolutionary proletariat, fill their hearts with irreconcilable hostility to oppression, teach them contempt for official morality and its democratic echoers, imbue them with consciousness of their own historic mission, raise their courage and spirit of self-sacrifice in the struggle. Okay. Now, I want to make it, it clear that the thing goes even deeper than this. Marxism denies even the most minimal content of morality. In other words, people like David Hume, the Scottish Enlightenment philosopher contemporary of Adam Smith's, and, and most philosophers will say, look, for human beings to just live together in society with the limited resources that we have available to us, with the limited powers of sympathy that we can mobilize in our own lives, have to have some kinds of generalized rule of conduct in order to live, in order to, to prosper, to get any kind of well-being. This is kind of a minimal defense and basis of morality. Marxists deny that. They deny, after all, that these minimal resources are here, that actually we're in a condition of ab abundance now that is being held in check by capitalistic property law. Okay, to believe, according to them, that there is a limited power of sympathy is really wrong because what Marxists are arguing is essentially, and this is a thing that we can also work on our potential socialist convert uh, with, with regard to, that the notion of a brotherhood of man or the family of man or something like that is something that ought to be the, the, the condition of this future utopia that they're calling for. You notice that they're taking a metaphor that's drawn out of the family, a very limited number of people that we can certainly have relations of sympathy and empathy and very strong notions of duty and so forth toward, and suddenly extending it to a huge, you know, the population of the entire world. Now, most people, if you ask them, can they really feel as strong emotional ties toward a person they've never met in Bhutan or Basutoland or Tasmania and their brother or their sister or their mother will tell you no. I mean, if they're honest with themselves, okay? And they can't really expect the whole world to become like that, even if they are so... Uh, you know, the, the unusual, as, as William Godwin, who once said that he would save a certain benevolent despot, uh, a benevolent, excuse me, benevolent bishop in a fire rather than his mother, okay? Uh, that's rare, okay? And th they can't really believe, I don't think, what Marxists are essentially arguing, that that kind of strong emotional intensity in the family can be extended to an entire globe. So the, the Marxists are denying these basic conditions of justice, as John Rawls calls them, or, or conditions of morality. So they are anti-moral. They really don't believe, they believe that it's an illusion, a bad thing to talk about rights, morals, ethics, that it's, it's contentless, and that if you're talking about anything, you're talking about either strategy for revolutionary success, or if you're the ruling class talking about morality, you're talking about how to keep the public baffled and bemused and not focusing on what is really taking place in society. 
I think if you get a socialist thinking about this, you will have them troubled and you can move them in a more libertarian direction. If they will accept some kind of moral position, you can then work on that. Most moral theories, utilitarian, Christian, Kantian, Aristotelian, Thomist, all have some sort of root, better or worse, depending on your own view, uh, toward a, a defense of libertarianism. You can't really take a person who is opposed to ethics per se and make them into a libertarian, okay? You just can't. And uh, so you have to convince the socialist of this. If they're already an ethical socialist, then the problem doesn't exist. You just have to work them along. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about another related thing because it has to do with, with justice and so forth, and that is the prospects for civil liberties in a socialist society. I think here, we have a very important insight that uh, other critics of Marxism don't really have. Well, a lot of the points I've been making so far, people of various non-Marxist views can make without too much difficulty. Uh, but uh, I think that libertarians have a unique insight in understanding how civil liberties work, how they're anchored, how they're grounded. And that is that um, we believe that the real guarantee of civil liberties is their anchor in property rights. That, that fundamentally, you cannot seriously talk about freedom of speech and freedom of the press without the right to own a hall in which one might speak, the right to rent out such a hall, uh, the, the right to own a printing press, the right to use that printing press to print on, the right to engage in sales of the material one prints, the right to own a transmission station, the right to send out that program to willing recipients, and so forth. So what you can do in discussing this with a socialist is to ask them how, if, if they believe, and many democratic socialists maintain they do believe that these gains, as they would say, of, of capitalistic civilization over feudal societies and so forth, namely uh, procedural rights for the, for the public, as, how, as they would see them, uh, how they expect to have freedom of the press in a society in which the government owns all the printing presses, all the newsstands, all the bookstores, pays all the salaries, owns all the the newsprint, that is the paper, all the ink, uh, sets the prices on everything, and just, you know, keep going, use your imagination. <laughs> uh, and I think they will, it's, I, I can assure you, because my dissertation is on this, that you won't find in socialist literature a great deal of discussion of this, so they're not going to be very prepared to answer you. And no socialist has ever answered it very well, uh, even the most sympathetic to having civil liberties in a socialist society. And I think you will have them not only on the defensive, and your goal is not to kind of defeat them in debate, okay, unless it is a, a formal debate, but to convince them, to, to unravel their commitment to this, their, to find unexamined things and get them thinking. So I think there's a, a great deal of merit to this approach in talking to a socialist. And you will find, uh, and this will be a, a kind of a bridge to my next subject, which is planning and the market and price coordination and so forth. You will find, of course, people who talk about themselves as socialists, but who are really something else that is kind of an intermediate position, which you might call a market syndicalist. Syndicalism is the idea of uh, collective self-ownership. It's, it's uh, the producers, that is, in, in the people that are working on some project, communally own the business enterprise that's putting the thing out and sell it to the public somehow, okay? So it's workers' control or 
uh, worker self-management. There are a number of terms that this goes under, and the, the classic term for it all is syndicalism from the, the word for a, 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 a trade union or something, a syndic. Okay, now a person who is a market syndicalist, and you can see in Yugoslavia today a kind of an imperfect case of this. There's a monopoly central bank for investment and some other problems there. But you can see some approximations to this. A person who is really a syndicalist to the fullest extent is a long way on the way to being a libertarian already. Okay, They are a potentially good prospect. Of course, in some ways, the final steps are the toughest ones to take them on. So don't think it's going to be easy. But at least realize that your prospects are good. Okay. Now, when you, when you talk to this market syndicalist, you want to keep pushing them in the direction of more and more market. And, of course, with that, you have to push the question of investment. How is investment going to work? Because if investment is in the hands of a centralized bank controlled by the government, they haven't truly depoliticized the society. They haven't truly gained the advantages that are going to strike them. They're not going to have true self-management if some political bureaucrat, some politburo or something, is deciding who's going to have investment money. Uh, similarly, there's problems of inequality between, uh, between worker enterprises that they're going to have to grapple with in their own minds. But, but even more so, how about people that want to leave this workers' control unit? They have to think about that, ask them about that. And ultimately, you're going to want to push them into saying, well, how does this communal group come to have a right to own or control what it has, what it's using? Okay? Because it's, we know as libertarians that it's not simply an easy, facile thing to justify the right of original appropriation. Okay, for, for most all libertarians, this is done through the homesteading notions that Locke and Kant and some other people have. But socialists have never really thought about this at all. And uh, therefore, you're on stronger ground once again than they are. And they really have to be able to do this. I mean, why does some person who's living in Kuwait, you know, near some oil well or something like that, have a right to work on it and reap the rewards from it and so forth. Why them? They have to answer that. Okay, and so you can push them farther and farther into having the answer to answer the questions that we have already thought about uh, seriously. And so I think there's a good chance here. Okay, now let's talk about planning in more detail here, because this is an additional way you can push them in the direction of market enterprises and private property. Now there's no question, it seems to me, that a very attractive thing for a true socialist is the notion of planning. <coughs> Marx is really capturing, uh, in his whole notions about alienation and, and so forth, a sense that a certain amount of people have out there that business activity, commercial life, is kind of doing things to them in an unplanned, random, chaotic way and that there's not a sense of controlling it, controlling what's happening. That is what Marx's notion of alienation is, is truly appealing to. It's not so much the, the tedium of the workplace. It's really that we are alien to our human nature in our life in the market where we face all these commodities and where we are made into commodities. Okay, and this is why Marx is attacking what he calls the anarchy of the market charming phrase to many of us. <laughs> so socialists in general, and, and I would sort of exempt these market syndicalists, and, uh, and you can see China also, by the way, moving in this direction of, of Yugoslavia. Uh, m most Marxists, most socialists are deeply interested in control of economic matters. Now, one of the first things that you can say to them is, look, there's kind of, this is, this is on the non-technical level, there's kind of a conflict in between your whole idea of a calculating, rationalistic, somehow cost-benefit planning group, planning bureau, central planner, something like that, and your expansive, humanistic, brotherhood of man, family of man view. How 
are you going to combine this sort of dictation rational imposition thing with your uh, notion that everyone is going to be in this uh, one is a, an appeal to expertise one is a technocratic notion the other is a, a different sort of a notion and I think that they will find some problems with that themselves and you're trying to explore fissures cracks self contradictions within their own doctrine and I think you will make uh, some progress with using the family metaphor back against the planning metaphor and seeing if, if they can really resolve this in their own minds. But there's a deeper, more important sense in which we can tackle planning. And this takes us into the somewhat technical area of the what is called the socialist calculation debate. Namely, is it really possible to uh, allocate resources uh, efficiently to their highest valued use in a socialist society, namely a society in which the state is the owner of the means of production. Okay. Uh, now, I think it's also useful in all of this, including in, say, talking about the conflict between top-down planning and humanistic brotherhood, to press them if they say, oh, we'll have planning from the bottom up. Okay, because some of them will say that. Make them say how it's going to work, because I don't accept any vagueness here. Make them spell it out. Uh, I think you can have some fun and don't be too cruel, but <laughs> you're trying to convince the person. This is not just a contest. But I think you can, uh, if, you, if you sincerely pursue it, I think privately you can notice some confusion on their part. And ultimately, if it's going to be planning, it's going to be central planning. And that's what you want to try and show them, and you want to show that this has a dictatorial element to it and an impossibility element. So let's first talk about the impossibility side of it. Now, back in the early 20th century, Ludwig von Mises and subsequently a number of other people, uh, especially uh, Friedrich Hayek and lately James Buchanan, have written about this problem of calculation under socialism. So your problem is that in a non-private property society, in a society in which uh, there may not even be realistic money prices. There may not be money at all in some sorts of socialist utopias. Um, you have a great deal of problems, especially with capital goods. You have problems in uh, the, you, you can't really put prices on capital goods. These are primary goods of production or uh, at, at, at some more remote level, goods of production, machine tools, things like that. Uh, you can't really put a price on them. You can't really decide what the best use is for them. You can't really decide whether the resources that went into them should have gone into something else. You can't really decide when to innovate, when to build a new dam, when to uh, tear down a dam and let a, a stream again flow free. These are serious problems. And believe it or not, a lot of Marxists, especially if they're sophisticated, have heard of this problem. And the more you learn about it, and the better you can argue about it, and it's not something I can explain in the few minutes remaining in detail, the, the more you'll have a chance at bringing them around to a pro-market perspective. The basic book that I would recommend is by Trig V. Hoff called Economic Calculation in Socialist Society. H-O-F-F, -F, and it's out in an inexpensive paperback from Liberty Classics, Liberty Press. And uh, just, just to read you the final concluding paragraph from it. Uh, the question, however, is not whether factories can be built and efficiently conducted, but whether the factors of production could have been put to a more advantageous use by employing them elsewhere. In a society whose aim is the maximum production of needs, its resources must not have been used for producing what may be momentarily lacking to have a certain value, but for producing goods which, according to the end stated, are of greater value than other goods. Each factor of production must be so employed as to give the greatest return according to the ends. This and only this is the criterion for rational economic activity. For determining this, there is a needed valuation apparatus, an apparatus with prices and costs varying with the variables 
to which one has to reckon in the world of reality. And it is here that there arise specific and so far unresolved difficulties for the socialist society. Now that paragraph, which as you can see is not too difficult in terms of economic jargon, does bring up though the fact that in learning how to talk about this, you have to learn how to talk about it to some extent in everyday language, okay? As I have been trying to do in terms of trying to say, should this machine tool have been built? Should it, so it should have been some other thing? Should it, this factory have never been put in? Should this dam have been put in or not ever put in? And so forth. Anyway, you do see among socialists some recognition of this problem. There are, uh, there are socialists that try and answer this, but I think the more you get into the debate, the more you realize that we have the better of the case. This is from an article this month in the Stanford Daily at Stanford. Democratic Socialists of America, which is the leading group of intelligent socialists in the United States, if we can accept that oxymoron. <laughs> okay, and a, a gentleman who is the <clears throat> Western regional organizer of DSA uh, made the following comment, and you can see that we are already sort of getting the higher ground here by what he says. This is a man I've known for many, many years, almost 20 years. I know a lot of these guys. <laughs> An important change in recent socialist policies, shock noted, is the acceptance in practice, if not in theory, of the capitalist open market system. Quote, there is no way that computers can plan an economy down to the last nut, close quote, he said. Okay, now listen, that's quite a bit of progress. And, uh, you know, you can ask these socialists, you know, why are the Chinese doing this? What is, the, what is going on? Why do you think, you know, and they, they will have their reasons, but keep raising these questions because uh, I, th I think it's, it's a, a worthwhile route in, in trying to detach them from their beliefs. Lastly, you want to though say something about what is this, all this talking of planning amounting to in practice? And you can go back to some of your previous concerns. Isn't it really a, a diktat by a dictatorial practice, by a ruling elite, a new ruling class, in, in the terms of Russian political jargon, the nomenklatura, the special designated categories class, okay? Isn't there a new class of political rulers of tyrants here that will oppress, that don't want to talk about justice and ethics because what they really want to do is rule, who don't want to have freedom of the press because when they're making the plans and making the economic planning, there's no room for freedom of the press, for carrying out. If you carry out plans, part of central planning is keeping the morale of the public and supporting the central plan. Now, even with the best intentions in the world, we wouldn't want to have the morale of those who have to carry out the central plan uh, undermined by learning that things aren't going perfectly. Therefore, we must control the press. Uh, aside from allocating the newsprint, allocating the salaries, allocating and so forth. The, the political dimension in central planning has to be brought forward. It's not simply what Marx is trying to pretend that it's an administrative function, the replacement of government by, of men by a, a merely administrative thing. It's a political dictatorial thing that's truly at work in reality in central planning. So I think if you can bring out these different concerns, you can attack and the core notions that socialists have about their beliefs and begin to bring them around. And with luck, with persuasion, with probably some more reading on your part, uh, you can take truly dedicated uh, political people and make them into allies, libertarians, and uh, that's all to the good. And it will also stretch your own mind and make your own grasp of libertarian principles and practice uh, better developed. Okay, well let me ask, answer uh, uh, some questions in the remaining moments here. <laughs> Sir.
the inherent con uh, contradiction of freedom versus this planning by the state. Mm -hmm. But I always get this one catch-all phrase. Uh, it's for the good, the overall good of all. A few will have to give up their rights. So I was wondering, and I just can't, that's a snowball. You know? It's like, uh -huh. Okay, well, the, the question, in case anybody didn't hear it, was this, this gentleman has had a number of conversations with uh, followers of Tom Hayden and John Jane Fonda, the Campaign for Socialist, Dem Campaign for Economic Democracy. And that, that brings up one point, is that this group uh, does not like to be called socialist and uh, does not like to admit to having socialist beliefs. So one way to kind of mildly needle them is to s call them social democrats or democratic socialists in their in conversation you know you can say you know and and see what that produces for you now but to get to the specific question which is what about the um, what about the claim that that these socialists are making that it's for the good of war well I guess you have to start out with saying the following, you say that, you need to convince me. How would we know it's for the good of war? How, what would it be that would be so convincing that would show that this thing is for the good of war? Uh, is it, surely we all want to have our human rights protected. That is something that's for the good of war. Uh, is what you're suggesting not going to violate any human rights? Is it, is it going to leave everybody in control of their own lives to the maximum extent possible? Uh, you have to kind of, yourself, you do believe that some things are for that, certainly that a system of private property rights is for the good of all, and uh, that it's compatible with human nature. So you have to try and bring them onto your ground to some extent and to ask them how to demonstrate, how to prove it. Show me, take the Missouri approach, you know. I'm not, I can't be, con I'm not convinced at this point. Uh, get them doing some of the talking. Remember, it's not, it's, it's, it's a dialogue, it's, 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 get them talking, especially at any point they're unraveling. <laughs> yes, yes, you <laughs> know, sir. Okay, did you did you hear what he suggested? Uh, I you know that that might work. I think that um, I think that uh, you you have to um, you have to raise you have to before you want to spend too much time defending your own position. It's better to work on unraveling theirs. You can if you can interweave the two. It's it's really quite effective, sir. Is it this, the suggestion is to, to push them to the reductio ad absurdum? Very useful mo method in. In the case of the argument, well, it's a good of all. But it's like, yeah, that was also Hitler's. That's what he said, too. And remember all those others? And how do we. But, but, but. but Okay, but, but what you want to say is. Now you, of course, don't, even though Hitler said this, you, of course, don't believe that it was for the good of all. How would we know that that's not the case? How would we know? And why would it, you know, or, the, or you can even step them a little closer to their own home ground. And surely we know that the, the 20 to 60 million people killed in Stalin's uh, camps uh, was not a good thing, and yet Stalin said that it was for the good of all. Surely there's something troubling here. How can we know? Yes, sir, in the back. And I'm one of the all. <laughs>
Okay, I think that's a good point. Let me just suggest one thing to watch out for, though. I wouldn't ever, I would never myself, and except by accident, want to appropriate to my position the word equal. And as you said, I have an equal right. I would say the same right, or I have full rights, or something like that. I think once you're accepting the, the groundwork of equality, even though there is a sense in which libertarians believe in something like equality of rights, it's very tricky, and I don't think you want to grant that term. You want to, you want to stick them with it and show it has deep problems. Sir. Yeah. Apparently what you're saying was Marxist too. It's a product of the culture and it's relative. Well, I'm not a I'm not a Hayekian. <laughs> I think I think I think that a Hayek is in to some extent a a uh, a person who incorporates realistically certain uh, Humean uh, modest utilitarian views and and some take some from Kant also. I don't think uh, I don't think, I think it's too strong to say that he is anti-morals in the sense that Marx. I, I can't accept Mr. Hayek's view. Well, I'm just saying, I'm just, I, I don't think so, but the important thing is to get the Marxist socialist to accept some moral principle, even if it's not the same one that you accept, and then work them down that principle toward libertarian, and meanwhile you can nudge them toward the one that you like best. I don't think that accepting a pure ethical relativist position is going to be an attractive way to defend libertarianism, because once you say Everything is up for grabs. There's no justice. There's no uh, sense of right and wrong that applies to liberty. I think you have uh, you've made a mistake, in my view, and you've you've given away very very important rounds of argument. Uh, let me just get some more questions. Yes, sir. Well, you can, you can, uh, may, may I address this? We're just about out of time here, so I, I'm going to have to make this the last question. Uh, you can do the same kind of thing. First, how do we know it's to the good of most? Second, is the good of, Hitler also said it was the good of most. He only killed a small group of people, the gypsies, the homosexuals, and the Jews. Uh, <coughs> How do we know Hitler was wrong? We're certainly troubled by what went on here. If to the good of most is what's at stake, he seemed to have quite a bit of popular support in the society at the time. Uh, again, Stalin felt it was to the good of most. Uh, not to the good of the capitalist class by any means, but to the good of most. And again, you can press them on this. You take, take them on the route. I thank you all for your patience and understanding, and I, I think with that we'll close the meeting.